Word in Your Attic, a Zoom with a View. Well, welcome to another Word in Your Ear, and we are delighted, we are thrilled to be joined by old pal, author, and music writer and broadcaster, Pete Perfidis. Pete, welcome to Word in Your Attic. Fantastic to see you. Great and, to be uh, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, where are you now, and how has life been during lockdown? It's okay, really. I mean, I, I, I'm a man of very few needs. Um, I, I, you know, here I am in the record room, which is, uh, which is always a lovely place to retreat to. And, um, you know, I quite, I quite like socialising. I quite like once removed socialising. So I'm quite happy with social media and all of that business. I don't, you know, I miss cafes because I do most of my work in cafes as well. And I like the kind of back, background hum of people going about their business. Cafes are the big thing I miss, really, which is terrible. I should, I should be saying people love people as well. Well, bizarrely, the last you know, time we saw you was March the 9th, which was the last Word in Your Ear podcast that we recorded in a, in a pub in Islington. Pubs, do you remember pubs? And Dave, that was pretty much the last social event you went out to, wasn't it, I think? It Before was. It, it definitely was. Yeah, we were just starting to, that evening, get used to the prospect of possibly not shaking hands and so forth. But there was still a feeling, oh, it might happen, it might not, not happen. But obviously, it did. But I like to feel that the last thing the Word in Your Ear did was launch Pete's book onto the bestsellers charts because ever since then it's been the runaway hit of the season for which we claim all the credit oh, frankly you, you, entirely yeah, down to us. us rightly so and it of course it has helped that very few books have come out since mine yeah uh, so. so that's really <laughs> yeah. uh, that's really yes. played in my way yeah. <laughs> that's true i hadn't thought of that but it's perfect word in your attic material because the whole book, this is broken Greek we're talking about, everybody, as you know. Is, the whole book is about um, your reaction to the records you heard throughout your life, starting when you were kind of four or five or something. So presumably you've got yeah. some of that stuff you've dug out for us. I'm gonna, the first thing I'm going to pull out in this impromptu show and tell session is uh, this jug. All right, okay. Uh, okay. This jug used to belong to John Renborn. The, <laughs> um, I know the uh, the celebrated folk jazz rhythm and blues uh, guitarist and bon viveur of the sixties, and I thought I might. It's a lovely jug. It, can, can you see that? Isn't that lovely? Yeah, it's very nice. Very and do you know nice. what John Renborn used to do with this jug? <laughs> he would fill it with very powerful alcohol. I should imagine. He did. He so, so I had a strange. I befriended John a little bit towards the end of his life, which is a very uh, which is a very surreal. Uh, situation to have found myself in because um, I was very lucky because in the 90s if you were um, a big fan of Pentangle I, I imagine you're both quite keen on the music of Pentangle aren't you? Well Mark music. is certainly I have less so oh, absolutely you know, he's was a huge fan. Ah, yeah. well, there's time yet David. And, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> and, um, and so um, and I think it was something of a novelty to them that um, someone under the age of 40 <laughs> yeah, had sudden, right. suddenly started writing about Pentangle. So I got into a bit of a correspondence with, with John and um, I wrote some liner notes for a box set. And he seemed very tolerant of me and I didn't, I don't, I didn't really understand why because my worldly experiences were very, uh, were, were very minor compared to, to his. And, um, and, and moreover, had, had, I, had I been born earlier, uh, the, and and been around at the same be, have been a contemporary of John's. I don't think he'd have liked me particularly much because I would have probably presented as much squarer um, into much naffer music than all those cool kind of, you know, those people that used to go to you know um, Ronnie Scotts and you know used to drink coffee all night long in Soho. You know, I would have been too lame for any of that. But anyway, we befriended each. He he could see that I was clearly a fan of the music, and. Um, in uh was it 2013 he invited me to the, his uh, uh, his little house which was a, a com uh, which was used to be a little chapel which was um on the scottish borders near hoik and uh and ostensibly in order to sort of have a conversation about order put, helping him put his archive into some kind of order so he might be able to write a book about his experiences and so um i am um, so i went you know it's quite a bit of a kind of Quite, it's quite a long time to get there. It's in the middle of nowhere. And I kind of checked into a B&B, &B, which was just, he was sort of at the bottom of a, of a mountain and the B&B &B was at the top. And you have to go down this little single track windy road to get to 
the path that led to his house and uh and even then you had to go over a little footbridge and you know it was quite a palaver i thought how on earth does john who wasn't the most mobile of men and you know as you'll remember john kind of had a kind of his bearing was very Father Christmas-like in the final uh, years of his life. And so I kind of left my stuff in the b and I kind of went down, I left my car in the car park because I thought I'll probably be expected to drink. And, uh, and just as I got to the gate, um, I saw John at the gate of his house. He'd just come, he'd just been shopping in Morrison's in Hoyk. And, uh, and he had... Um, he had a little a carry bag with like wine and some frying steak and some cheese that he put into a wheelbarrow along with a kind of an oil canister and he was about to wheel it down this kind of path and i waved to him i said john i'm here i'm here i'm here i was oh great great do you want to help me with this oil canister and so i carried this kind of oil canister down to oops, this kind of winding path and it must have been about four o'clock in the morning and he sort of he, and the first thing he did virtually was he uncorked <laughs> A bottle of wine and decanted it into this jug to let it breathe. <laughs> that's a proper folk welcome. Isn't that, it? Yes, what you'd expect. Absolutely. That's what you'd expect. Yeah, that's most, fantastic. Higgledy piggledy, Mr. Tumnus. He kind of, Mr. No, no, not Mr. Tumnus. Mr. Uh, who was the um the, the hoarding the 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 famously hoarding guy who um it'll come to me anyway. Okay. Uh, anyway, he was um he had. He had like six kind of gramophones and like, you know, 30 guitars and, and books and ephemera everywhere. He had a, and he had, and his cooker, he offered, you know, we started drinking and after a while he said, well, look, I've got this steak, I've got this cheese. Would you, I'm going to fry myself a steak. Would you like some steak as well? And he, his cooker was encrusted with sediment for, of, of, of food that he'd cooked and fried. <laughs> Previous fry-ups. His frying pan was the most incredible thing I've seen. You know, it was just and for him for him to have survived that a long. Petrol student. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And um so um we had so we had the the, the it's no coincidence that shortly after that I stopped drinking uh, because I just thought that we, can, we can't sort of eclipse it. So, but we stopped went, eating too, I should imagine. <laughs> we, went to the small, we went into the small hours and he played me lots of incredible old sort of blues records and told me all these amazing stories uh, about people who are no longer alive mostly. And then um, we were really in a sort of state by about kind of one or two in the morning and I'd, somewhere along the line I agreed that evening to drive him to the house of an associate of the Incredible String Band um, on the outskirts of Glasgow. And I thought, well, Glasgow is probably just an hour away, but it wasn't. It was about sort of four hours away. But um, and anyway, but uh, and so at the end of the evening, John insisted as a matter of honor that he would drive me back to my. Oh, bedroom. joy. <laughs> and uh, John's vehicle at the time was uh, a, a sort of green converted school minibus. And uh, and John, I mean, there's no way it, around. John was way over the limit, and I was just terrified for my life. But John was quite a sort of explosive character, and stuck in the middle of nowhere with John, and with no other sort of real. Well, I wanted to walk home, but he wouldn't let me. And so he said, "Get into the get into the van. I'm driving you home, and I'm not here. I'm going to hear a word against it." And so I thought, well, if I survive this, and if John survives, then maybe i should just stop drinking forever or something so right. he kind of drove, me, drove me up the hill and he was he was i can't i don't understand how he got to the top of that hill and he went up the kind of incline to the b and b and i sort of and i kind of got dressed put my pajamas on got ready for bed and then i got heard a very very angry knock at the door and it was this very formidable woman that ran the b and b and she said your friend has completely ruined my flower beds. You need to come over right now and take over this situation because it's totally responsible of you to have let him drive you up to oh, in, in that state. And um, I love the fact but, that folk musicians are so much more rock and roll than rock and roll musicians. I know, and I had no, cho I had no choice but to, um, to, to, to go down and sort of try and remonstrate with John. So John, you sort of, she, anyway, she thundered on ahead of me. And by the time I sort of uh, put my shoes on and went down to see what had happened, her flower beds were in total disarray. And she'd managed to sort of move John from, from his bus to 
this her tiny little Renault Clio, and so I could see John, the last thing I saw of John was in the passenger seat of her tiny Renault Clio, sort of giggling at me as if to say, "See, it turned out all right in the end." <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, I, I wrote about this, and he and his um, John's daughter very kindly sent me this jug. Oh, very good. Um, great. After I was God, God, God. What else have you got there? What's my, what else have I got? Um, so um. Let me just uh, consult my. Uh, okay, <laughs> I thought um, maybe this might yeah. be brief. I thought I'd show you a couple of Baron Knights albums because Baron oh, Knights, yes, Baron Knights feature heavily in my book. And uh, <laughs> John Remborn, the Baron Knights. That's where we're going. Yeah, all human life is here. Yeah, it's highly targeted channel. This is <laughs> on carry on. This is very no, we're on the favour of this. Go on. This is a very old Baron Knights album from the 60s that someone gave me recently. Because now people give me right. Baron Knights. People give me Baron Knights records now because they just think that, that they just think they've got to go somewhere. They found, they found someone who will gladly receive all Baron Knights records. God, this I is, don't remember uh, that. So this is an album. This is a Baron Knights album. This is the only Baron Knights album I still play because the funny stuff doesn't really do it for me so much anymore. But the, they were a comedy, we should explain, like, they were a kind of comedy band that did these pastiches mm. of uh, the pop hits of the time. I, I, got, I got their first EP, I think it was called Call Up the Groups in 1974. Well, it was kind of pastiches of the, of, um, you know, um, the Beatles and the Stones and the Dave Clark Five, wasn't it? I got, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and weirdly enough, I got, um, I got a, um, a, a, a message from David Gilmore via his wife, Polly Sampson, on Twitter. He, David was reading my book a, a few weeks ago, and she, she, he relayed via Polly that um, he had in fact seen the Baron Knights several times in the early 60s, and remembered that they were a very entertaining group to go and see in the early 60s. So David Gilmore was a, um, a big Baron Knights fan. So there you go. Um, so there you go. This is an wow. album. Look God. at that. God. Great cover. Wow. It's like so a Charles this is a brilliant book. cover. This is what I love, right? When um, the early seventies, as you you guys don't need me to tell you, was a kind of was a very interesting time for bands who maybe had had some success in the sixties, but had to just think of something to do to keep going. Yeah. And Knights made this quite weird. Right? This is their attempt to turn into a serious rock band. Oh, really? I yeah. never seen. It. What's it called? It One Man's Meat. One yeah. Man's Meat. Yeah. And uh, you and know, it, I've never seen that. Some penny farthing records. Ah, right. That's why I've never seen it. <laughs> penny farthing, well known for their distribution. <laughs> it's got some very sort of strident, kind of like slightly muddy proto power pop songs, such as "You're All I Need" on there, which um, which are very good. Uh, but obviously, who on earth? It was a bit like when the Shadows uh, split up. Um, yes. Bruce Welsh and Hank Marvin formed Marvin Welsh and Farrah, yeah. thinking that the world was perfectly happy to hear a sort of harmony vocal group. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's the great truth about popular music. If you're, if you're known for one thing, you cannot be known for something else, no. can you? You can't change at all. The public won't have it. No. And that was a classic case. And it's tragic, isn't it? Because we, with hindsight now, we can see that that was never going to work for Br Br Bruce Welsh and Hank Marvin. And it kind of broke them, didn't it? Because after that, they reformed the shadows and became, turned into this sort of cabaret band. And those pull-out shelves behind you, they're, they're like filing drawers. You're right, lovely. Yeah, drawers, That's very yeah. good. I haven't seen it done like that. It's gorgeous. Thank Pretty you. Nice. And I wanted it to be a bit like, um, there you go. There's Gene Pitney. Um, I wanted it to be a bit like being in a record shop, the experience of being in a record yes. shop. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Browsing. So. No, no, that's a good thing, actually. Do you know, I've never seen that before in a domestic situation. Thank you. That's well, really, I, really good. I like that. I had them specially made because I wanted to feel like I was in a record shop at all yeah, times. No, okay. So, so I, I, you I, should I, really I, just have the covers and then go back and find the album. And separate <laughs> the old separate so that nobody nicks it. The old <laughs> yeah. master bag system. As these that's right. Play. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, my rules, no one else really wants to come in here. My children are scared of this room, so, um, <laughs> yeah. so, so it's absolutely fine. Um, so, um, I, um, so before there were too many records to put a desk in it, this used to be my office as well. 
I used to, uh, and you know, when you have an office next to the front of the house, sometimes you see people do things uh, when they think that no one can see them, which is one of the great joys of life. And uh, there was a period when we had, uh, so we were having some work done and we had a skip outside. And, uh, and there, was a, there was a little old lady that lives in, <laughs> in the flat uh, across the road. And uh, she sort of, I was looking at my window, she crossed the road, she couldn't see that I was looking at her. She crossed the road, like with a slightly suspect look on her, like she was about to do the naughtiest thing she'd ever done in her life. <laughs> she looked from left to right and then and lifted up a little bag, like a carry bag that was maybe about a third full. And her transgression was to put some items in our skip. And uh, and she scuttled away, and I thought, I wonder what she's put in that skip. <laughs> You're about to show us, presumably. <laughs> oh, yeah. She was having a <laughs> she was having a clear out of her kitchen, and this is what she, this is. I'll, I'll go. I'll, I've, I've chosen two items. I'll pick out the least remarkable first, so we can work up. You see what that is? Mixed spice. It's pretty old. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. look at the, yeah. Look at the price. Can you see the price there? I can't see the price. Oh, God, was it 30? I don't know, 32? Uh, no, I can't see the price. Go on, you're going to have to tell me what it is. Old money. 32 pence? No. Th no, 32 and 6 or something. I don't know. Don't. Yeah, I think it... Oh, hang on. No, oh, it's, it's old old measurements and old money. Right. And then, <laughs> and then look at this. <laughs> Ready made? What, ice cream in a tin? <laughs> it can't be. Is oh it? my lord! Oh, it's the mix, it's ice it. cream mix. Yeah, look, look at so that. That's that's really really that might even be the 1950s. Look at that. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. <laughs> Eighty percent whale blubber. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Look, that's horrendous. Oh, oh look at go the oh, old god. god. Very good. good. And it got me thinking about how you know, sort of. I think there's this kind of salutary sort of lesson here because I sort of think that. You know, as we get older, time goes by more quickly. And we don't really, we sort of, I, we all have, we open our kitchen cupboards and we sort of, we don't really stop to think about how long things have been in our, in our sort of cupboards. And suddenly it's 2008 and you, you finally think, well, maybe I won't use that ice cream that I've had in my cupboard for 30 years. <laughs> yes, since, since Harold McMillan was probably... <laughs> Are we really so different to that old lady? Because I, kind of, I, have, I have this all the time where I don't update. I don't update thoughts. I don't really stop to think about how long has elapsed since I kind of updated my mental files. And so to, a good example, I think, is um, Warren Cuccarillo, the guitarist in Duran Duran, all right, who, okay. um, who joined Duran Duran in 1986 and subsequently left. In 1980, in, in 2001, I think, and I still think of him as the new guitarist in Duran Duran. Well, it's the same with Ronnie Wood in the Stones, isn't no, it? it He's the new the, member. The classic, <laughs> since 1976. The classic case of this: somebody pointed out to me recently that the guy who plays the bass in the Rolling Stones nowadays is it Daryl Jones? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you know, he's just has, he's been a, has been the bass player of the Rolling Stones longer than Bill Wyman was the bass. Perfect. Which that's, is just. Yeah. <laughs> and still nobody knows his name because you no. can't mess with Bill Wyman and the Rolling Stones. You know, yeah. He can leave, but he's still there as far as we're concerned. Yeah, and so I'm constantly looking out for sort of thoughts that I need to update because subconsciously I still think they're quite recent realisations. Like last year, I stopped putting milk in my tea first because I suddenly remembered that my friend Andrew, who I was at university with, with whom I was in a cafe in 1990, and he said, oh, it always tastes better when you put the milk in first. I had just taken his view as gospel and not questioned it for 30, nearly 30 years or something. And similarly, <laughs> you know- These are I important really, issues. Do I really need to wear a hat with, when my hair is wet? Or have I simply just not updated that thought since I, someone told me that that was the case at the age of 11? Yeah, so, it's, very, it's very often things your mother has told you, isn't it? When you're yeah. young, you know, it goes in the special drawer in your, in your mind. So I think we're all a bit like that, you know, old, the old woman 
and the, in the skiff across. I love the idea that she didn't bother just chucking them away in the bin. She obviously thought she'd got it, they'd had to be disposed of properly by experts. You yeah. know what I mean? And what would she think if she came to a house and she saw that there was the I mean, I, it's on Let's the hope she's watching door. this. <laughs> It's an ornament on my shelf now. Literally. <laughs> if, she, if she looked through the window, she can see the ice cream she's trying to throw away. Uh, so um, that's uh, that's uh, hang on. So just um, a couple of brief things here. Um, we don't need to dwell on these very much. This is uh, in the book. Um, if you remember that far back, I I I sort of mention. Um, I, you know, there's some, there something I wanted to say for quite a while. This seemed like a good, good place to say that there were just generally less things in the world, generally, in, certainly in the early 80s. And so it was possible to get excited about physical items that were actually not very interesting in a way that would be incomprehensible to people now. And there's a section in the book where um, I uh, talk about... Um, a consignment of stickers that that were had been dumped by a local factory it's sort of in the in the vicinity it was a filter factory and we just turned up to, to school one day and there were just stickers everywhere and they all they all had the logo of this filter company called harmo on them and um and before and there were, you know these things had currency there and we sort of we just stuck them everywhere because they were just adhesive pieces. They were stickers. <laughs> yeah, look, and the, here's an exercise. Here's the cover of an exercise book. <laughs> I covered with Harmo stickers, and uh, and here's another exercise book at the age of twelve, where this is my music exercise book, and I thought that my teacher might be impressed if I put the lyrics to "Sleeping Gas" by the Teardrop Explodes. Very good. On it. And, oh, uh, that's lovely. And I saw, and I'm so into the idea that it, this is a kind of in, in any way an interesting thing to do. But I, in brackets here, I've even put turn to the back of the book to see the rest of the lyrics of Sleeping Gas. <laughs> I love the way you you identify in the book that uh, the fur-lined flying jacket worn by Julian Cope is one of the key kind of pieces of uh, of uh, important ephemera in rock and roll. Oh, it has yeah. a huge effect on you. And my brother handed it uh, handed it down to me a couple of years later, and then I made the terrible mistake when I was lucky enough to um, blag an interview with Julian Cope for my fanzine. I was still uh, I was just turned seventeen at this point. I thought Julian would be very impressed if I turned up to interview him wearing the flying jacket. Oh no! I mean, you know, it's still I'm, I can't really think about that. <laughs> You probably wake up in the middle of the night and snap into a fetal position when you think about it. You know, well, there are thought, always professional memories yeah. that do that to you, aren't there? Well, the lovely thing was that you know Julian sent me a nice email after the book came out and sort of and you know saying nice things about the book. So I sort of felt I could finally let that slight, try and let that embarrassment go. Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard from people you wrote about in the book? Because you write about the Rubettes and you write about the Brotherhood of Man and all those, you know, people who aren't normally celebrated in, in the book. Have right. they, Leo Sayer, have they been in touch and said how um, flattered they are that you said such nice things about them? Sadly not, you know, and there's somehow, I mean, the daughter of the lead singer of The Fortunes has been in touch and she enjoyed the book greatly and was very pleasantly surprised to find him, Rod Allen, uh, right. mentioned, mentioned in the book. And, uh, Sort of some cooler musicians, no, 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 no one from that milieu, but um, certainly some some cooler. So I haven't heard from little Jimmy Osmond, who, as you can <laughs> see here, is immortalised on this packet. Uh, that's got the that's got the price on it too, isn't it? Was it ten p? I can't read it from you. Letra set pop star transfers. Oh, um, wonderful! Fantastic. Yeah, that's an idea that could be brought back. I know, I know. But, but do, do the kids like letra set these days? Or I, it... I don't know. <laughs> it's probably due. Well, or we did, we did a, a panini uh, pop stickers on Smash Hits, didn't we, Dave? In nineteen eighty-two. Well, they're hugely popular. And they popular. was a massive, yeah. it was a massive. Oh, yeah. I can. I still got them. parts of this house that got furniture that my children stuck pictures of Depeche Mode and orange juice on. You can't get the stickers off. But and they yeah, were very, like, very successful. And Lawrence from Felt made it onto a sticker. <laughs> in the, isn't that amazing? A to higher praise. 
Talking of smash hit stuff, I don't know if I've shown you this, Mark, on previous Word in Your Attics. I found this recently. That's a squeeze. Oh, squeeze that's flexi, a squeeze yeah. flexi disc, which was on the cover of Smash Hits in, I don't know, 79, 80, What's something the song like on that? that. Sorry? What's the song? Wrong Way. Oh, uh, but, it, you know, it's amazing to think those, you know, going back to what you were saying about how, how there was so much less stuff in those yeah. days. That could get people quite excited. Oh, yeah, it was so impressive. Oh, a floppy disk like that. It's it totally absolutely got me excited, yeah. And also, so it, I'm similar, but part of the reason why I'd set aside these pop star transfers, look, here are Slade, by the way. Right. Can rub, rub Noddy Holder off. You can rub, rub Dave, I could rub Dave Hill onto this John, Re John Rembold's job. <laughs> 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 And then, and then, pop cultural archaeologists in years to come would be trying to work out. We'll be what, confused. Work out what, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> but again, you know, the, the, the thing about these transfers were, uh, it was I bought these from a place in Birmingham called International Stock Warehouse, which was <laughs> a, pla a place where just unwanted stuff. Items, yes. Just went, the last call, the last stop of all unwanted <laughs> items. Uh, that would just be sold off for next to nothing. So, and I was so bored with my life, but there were so few items that were just generally available for someone to buy with their pocket money. That even though I couldn't name more than one Slade song at this point and had dim, scary memories of the Osmonds, I still deemed these two things worth purchasing <laughs> in the, uh, sometime in the 80s. That's um, what they used to call in the retail trade, that whole sector of stuff. They used to call fancy goods. <laughs> and and very often you could buy i don't even remember this as a child or when your children were younger or whatever that they very often went through a stage where the stuff they were most passionate about could only be bought at news agents yeah couldn't be got in kind of big stores or anything like that it was felt stickers and stuff like that you know stuff that yeah. glowed in the dark and all that Colored kind of pens crayons. Yeah, yeah, yeah you could only get it in post offices and places like that where it would be on spinner racks oh yeah those yeah. were fancy goods and there's a huge market in fancy goods which used to be based in birmingham actually it used to take place in the nec every year it used to be a huge great in a spring fair where the sp the fancy goods trade would meet and it was worth millions. Oh, can That's you imagine, like, if you had a time machine and the things you would see at the, yes. the NEC fancy goods fair? Now, <laughs> you would. You I mean, would. I, in the book, I sort of mentioned that my, the first time I went to the NEC was when I tagged along with my dad to the NEC motor show and some, and you know, was suddenly exposed to these stalls where, where like, sort of scantily clad glamorous <laughs> young women were sort of handing out leaflets to uh, a little kind of gizmos to anyone like me so they'd see like this 12 year old boy coming along and uh and they you know they'd sort of hand me just some brochures about a car and one of them handed me um, an air pressure gauge uh, uh one of these little me metal things and it just felt so sp it felt quite precious to me because first of all <laughs> a, a lovely lady had given it to me <laughs> And it was free. <laughs> it was free, and it was retractable. It was <laughs> yeah, perfect. You know, win, win, win. <laughs> you know, I was, I was such a moron. <laughs> I just remember seeing in the passenger seat of my dad's car, and my poor dad, who you know, he just didn't didn't want to take his fucking son to the motor show. Like, <laughs> one day off a week, and he's got. A, drag around this kind of slight listless socially kind of maladjusted kind of pudgy young kid around with him while he kind of tries to have a bit of nice you know a bit of a break and look at nice cars and he said i just remember just being driving home him driving me home on the way back as i kind of slightly retracted my little <laughs> and, uh, and to add an extra layer of pathos to the whole thing i remember the, the, the song i remember playing on the radio was Save Me by Queen. <laughs> it's kind of collision of slightly... Yeah, oh sort of fantastic. And talking, <laughs> and talking of, uh, of that particular period in my life, here's another exercise book. This is... Uh, I was in class 1A, I was, so right. that means I was 11 years old, and Mr Woods was my English teacher. And this was, we had two English teachers. We had an English teacher who taught us a slightly more kind of 
boring but necessary grammatical stuff. And, uh, and then we had Mr. Woods, who was there to sort of teach us how to put a bit of flair in our writing. And we were encouraged to write stories, we were encouraged to use our imagination. And, uh, and I, I don't know what the exact brief was that week, but um, I wrote a, a story which I thought I might read for you, if that's okay. Go on, no, go no. on yes. Okay, so we can date it, even if we didn't know what the year was, we could, we could date this in the timeline because <laughs> the story is called The Rise and Fall of Los Rancheros Supergroup. And uh, of course, I was inspired to call this supergroup Los Rancheros because of the Adam and the Ants album track, Los Rancheros, which was on the recently released um, Kings of the Wild Frontier. Um, so um, here we go. Los Rancheros were a talented pop group. They played in clubs and youth, <laughs> youth centres around West Bromwich, Walsall, <laughs> Derby, <laughs> and Wolverhampton. <laughs> <laughs> it's very David Brent, Sammo, is it? Those kind of suburban names. <laughs> oh, no. Go on, sorry. Anyway, it was May the 17th, 1973, and they were on their way to Phonogram Records Limited. <laughs> the dream of Los Rancheros was to make a record and to get into the top 40. Bobby Taylor, bass, <laughs> bass guitar and vocal, Dave Reed, drums, <laughs> and Benson, vocal, Frida Murray, she's Dutch, vocal, I've already put she's Dutch here, and John Hughes, keyboards, formed the group. The group went into the studio. It was great. There was a special stage and the atmosphere was like lightning. They eventually got on the stage and sang a few of their songs. The first was a Wild West kind of song <laughs> called Go For Your Gun, followed by a track called We're Made For Each Other. As you could probably guess from the title, uh, <coughs> so as you could probably guess from the title of this story, they passed and made a record. In four months, they had booked their first concert following their first single, which had got to, <laughs> which had got to number 46. Oh, what a random place to, <laughs> to choose. <laughs> well, at least in the top 50. <sighs> On the eve of the concert, the group were quite tense. Bobby came in with some news. Hi, gang. Guess what? Our <laughs> concert's good. <laughs> Our concert's going to be played live on the radio tomorrow and we're going to be interviewed afterwards. The concert came. The surroundings were magnificent. The red, blue, green, white lighting. There wasn't one dark... <laughs> there wasn't one dark corner. <laughs> ah, sorry. Control yourself. Ah, Los Rancheros were on their flight to the top. They released another single. It went straight to number two. They won a Daily Mirror Award for Best Newcomers in Pop Music. They got one million five hundred eighty-eight One million five hundred eighty-eight thousand nine hundred specific pounds in receipts from their UK tour. They got to number one twice, but in August 1975, it all went horribly wrong. Sorry. Frida and her three-year-old girl had died in a fire. Oh, God. No! It's a movie! <laughs> oh, dear God! It's a film script! In their £90,000 home in the Harry <laughs> <laughs> Ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I need to compose myself. Dave narrowly, Dave narrowly escaped with minor injuries. They were, deep, <laughs> they were deeply shocked, and a year later, Bobby broke his arm and a leg in a car crash. <laughs> Six months later, he and Dan left the group. In 1977, though, two new members arrived. <laughs> Three months later, they released their eighth single. It towered up to number six. That was their last major hit. Dave later emigrated to Canada and joined another group. The rest of the group went to New Zealand. They are now known as a group called Air Supply. 
that's ex- what attention to detail. What, that, that, what a lively imagination. The death the, is the turning point. For it's me, le- less a story than an entry in the New Musical Express book of rock, isn't it, from 1975? You know, yeah. you know, it's like a band biography, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. is. I've got it intrigued me when I only discovered this a few weeks ago. What intrigued me was I just take an air supplies name and just <laughs> yeah, I did. I like also your prediction of how much money you would make out of a, a record that went to number two. I think I know yeah. one, one was it one point one million pounds <laughs> in, in old money as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 worth having. That's worth a lot. Well, maybe, maybe it was true then. Less true now, perhaps. So is that your is that your next book, Pete? You're gonna you're gonna you're you're going look at mining your juvenilia and and gonna put it out. I think you should. Well, that 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 would have been in the timeline of the last one, but I thought I thought maybe sort of replicating the entire story of Los Rancheros um, in the book <laughs> might have just been one detail too many. But um, <laughs> we'll we'll see. I'm not yeah. I'm not really um thinking too far ahead. No, I bet. I bet. Oh, it's fantastic. Well, it's been lovely. To, have you got anything else to sh- you want to show us before we before we say goodbye and let you let you carry on with your pack day? I was hoping to see a, a copy of Pop Scene, the 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 the, 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 the music well, magazine know, you invented we... when you're about ten, which is so brilliant in the book. Thank the you. Bit where you, you review a, a Depeche Mode record and say something like, "All the noises are made on synthesizers," which is absolutely <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Yeah, not entirely approvingly, sadly, to my shame. Um, I've got other things, but it's, um, I just, I literally, I wasn't going to show you this, but I looked, I found it, I saw it in the periphery of my vision. This is a magazine, this would have been a, a, wow. a very unformidable rival to smash hits. God, is that Toya? Yeah. I suppose it was always Toya, is it? Okay. Smash, this would have been more trying to compete with looking. Yeah. And what's interesting here is, do you remember that, you know, you remember the face that John Lennon used to pull in photographs in the 60s that, that would quite rightly be regarded as problematic? Now? Yes, yeah. certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was still alive, it was still alive and well. Oh, and, right. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. There you go. Um, you can't so, do that anymore. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can top the story of Los Rancheros. So, uh, <laughs> Maybe Pete, I'll let you all go. Thank you very it's much. Brilliant to talk to you. It's been Fantastic. absolute, very absolute joy. Um, thank you. And uh, you know, all the very best. And uh, and we'll 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 see you on the other side. 